this is uh, lecture 16. Okay, so this week we'll have a couple of lectures today and tomorrow, and then uh, Wednesday and Thursday I'm, I'm out. So there's, there'll be no class on Wednesday and Thursday. Uh, so two lectures. Let's see where we. Okay, so the last thing we saw in the previous class was this uh, square root of raised cosine. Okay. So, uh, so I'm going to write that down once again real quick, but before that, I want to draw the, the whole system once again. It's good to just keep reminding ourselves as, as to where this, where this, where everything fits in. It's quite important. Okay, so this is the kind of picture block diagram that you should keep in mind when you're thinking of uh, this, this whole, the whole ISA and all these things. Okay, so you have what I called as a vector b, okay, b0 through b, l minus 1, n times, l bits, okay, and then you have a constellation, script x, okay, so the size of this constellation is what, 2 power n, okay, so that's how I'm, that's how I'm imagining my constellation to be, okay, so as, as a result you get, Okay, a sequence of, in general, complex numbers, a k plus j b k. Okay, so you, you're imagining L symbols here. Okay, and here I'm going to put what I called a transmit filter, right? So g of t, this is my transmit filter. It's also sometimes called a pulse shaping filter. Okay, so it shapes your pulse. Okay, and uh, okay, so there are various choice ways of uh, picking it. First of all, it has to fit into the bandwidth of your channel under consideration, and then it's also good to have g of t and g of t minus k t being orthogonal. Okay, so if you do all that, then you will have no ISI. It's almost as if you're dealing with the same picture as before. Okay, so so let me qualify that more. But anyway, that's the transmit filter. So in general, you can think of g of t without worrying about anything as a square root raised cosine filter. Okay, so its simple response is actually given by square root of the raised cosine. Okay, so the only situation that it won't take won't take into consideration is the very first situation we saw. What was the very first setup for us? And when our signaling time is extremely large compared to 1 by w. Okay, so I'm choosing a very, very small bandwidth. In that case, what was g of t? What was g of t? It was a constant between 0 and t, right? So we could choose a very simple g of t at that case. Okay, so now when we want to increase our bandwidth to a signaling rate close to the bandwidth, we can't do that anymore. You'll have to deal with ISA. If you want to get rid of ISA also, then you'll have to have a square root raised cosine. Okay, so that's the that's the setup there. Okay, so then you do then you do what? Then you do an up conversion and then a down conversion. Okay, so I'm simply going to ignore that just for sake of space in this picture. Okay, so you do an up conversion, down conversion. Okay, some noise gets added and all that. Okay, after you do the up conversion and down conversion, what do you do next? Okay, assuming I took care of ISI, okay, well, I should put a channel here, I'm sorry. I'll put a channel here. So, I'll write my channel in baseband, right? So, since I didn't write the up conversion, down conversion, this is a baseband channel. And I assume the bandwidth of minus W by 2 to w by 2 okay so this was my ideal channel okay so very ideal channel and phase when I mean you can assume zero phase or we'll say linear phase for ideal for an ideal channel adjusting for delay late. okay so then the noise noise gets added to it okay assuming orthonormality is satisfied for g of t and g of t minus kt and all that 
all i have to do here is what match filter okay so you do g star of minus t okay and sample every t seconds okay if it was not true if it was not true that g of t and g, g of t minus t and all that are orthogonal then this is not optimal anymore you can't do these things okay you'll have to do something else but since i chose my g of t to be a square root raised cosine and i chose my bandwidth suitably i know that i can do g star of minus t and sample every t okay so what will i what will i get once i do that i can be sure that what i get will be s of k plus noise if you did not know that i might get something i don't know what i'd be getting okay so that's the next thing to keep in mind all right okay so a few more things i want to point out okay suppose instead of choosing so so when i when i do match filter by g star of minus t i'm doing correlation with some orthonormal basis what is that orthonormal basis g of t g of t of t minus t and so on so can i choose any other orthonormal basis for the same set of signals and do correlation can i do that will i lose optimality in any way some other set of yeah as long as they are orthonormal you should not lose optimality but then what will you lose is will is there something that you will lose if i choose some other orthonormal basis here as opposed to g star of as opposed to g of t minus kt yeah the isi you're not sure if it will go away or not right right so you might have to do more complicated detection okay so this may not be just s of k plus n of k it might be s of k plus some constant times s of k minus 1 some other constant times s of k plus 1 then you have to do a complicated detection we don't know how to do detection for that yet okay so we might see it later on but for now we only know how to do detection when my symbol only noise gets added to my symbol okay since i chose my orthonormal basis to be g of t minus kt again i'm i'm having to do only this very simple detection as in there is no isi okay so the fact that we eliminate isi is important for the detector okay so that's the those are the things to keep in mind okay so you run a simple detector with no isi so i can run this detector for each k okay if i had isi i cannot do this okay and it wouldn't be optimal anymore okay so you should know which part of it is optimal for what reason okay so don't have to simply take each block to be as it is you could choose another orthonormal basis as long as you know how to detect the resulting signal resulting symbol values you get okay so that's the main thing to keep in mind okay so this ultimately will give me b hat okay so this is the picture and uh, just to complete this picture let me draw let me write down the square root raised cosine expression because one could pick that as opposed to anything else so the square root raised cosine g of t is 4 beta divided by pi root t cos 1 plus beta pi t by capital t plus t sin 1 minus beta pi t by capital t divided by 4 alpha t whole thing divided by 1 minus okay so suddenly i put alpha there for beta t by capital t square okay so this is a fairly complicated looking expression from what we had before so previously when you were willing to so now what is t what is t that's important 1 by t which used to be equal to what w by 1 plus beta okay and this is true for any beta between 0 and 1 okay so this is this is all this this is very important don't don't ignore this okay this is an important design choice you're making okay so you can't uh, happily throw that out 1 by t the signaling rate symbol rate okay we are choosing to be w by 1 plus beta you could choose to be equal to w in which case this g of t should become a sink okay there was some question as to whether that works out or not i think at the end people agreed that it works okay so it should work out hopefully you see that all right so so like i said before when t is very very large when you choose your signaling rate to be extremely small 
you can get away with the g of t which is flat between 0 and your signal sim symbol time 0 to t okay so that's good in one way it simplifies your correlator and all that even your transmitter gets detected and this is more complicated in the sense that every t seconds you're producing a signal which lasts for a long time okay so well this will not be causal so you'll have to shift it to the right by suitable amount to get it causal maybe it will last for four or five symbol intervals maybe four or five is too less maybe it's 10 symbol intervals okay right so that's fairly complicated when you think in terms of implementing at the transmitter right so every signal you produce at every for every symbol will last for how many symbols say some 10 symbols okay you'll have to choose that uh, how, how will you make the choice why did i say 10 why can't it be 100 okay so you have to plot this and see after how many symbol uh, symbol times does it become very small and i can ignore it okay so 10 seems like a good number to pick okay so maybe it lasts for 10 symbols so it complicates your transmitter right so whenever you transmit a symbol not only do you have to add the contribution from that symbol you have to add the contribution from 10 previous symbols but since i chose my sig pulse shape to be specifically a square root raised cosine and then I correlate on the receiver with g star of minus t my s of k by what I get after sampling at t will only have that symbol corresponding to that particular okay so those are a little bit of a complicated picture in mind but I also drew a simple picture to show why at every t seconds the pulse shape is going off to zero and why it doesn't get any contribution okay so that's a simple way of thinking about why it's working out that way okay I also asked another question at that point. Is it settled? It's settled? Any answers for why something like that is? Okay. Okay. Suppose I don't have a low pass filter, then yeah, then noise will go through the roof. Okay. So if your noise is very very large bandwidth compared to your signal, if you don't use a low pass filter there, then noise. Will go. Okay. So those are things to keep in mind. An intelligent question to ask, which you might face in a quiz or an exam, is. I pick g of t as some square root raised cosine okay, with, with beta not 0 and then I use only a low pass filter, right? an ideal low pass filter at the receiver. What do you think will happen? Okay. Yeah. So how do you quantify that? Do you think you have all the tools to quantify that is some question you have to ask yourself. Okay. Did this question make sense to everybody or looks like enough people are staring at me like I asked a very complicated question. Okay. So that's an interesting thing to do because in the receiver you may not want to do this g star of minus t which is fairly complex. Okay, So you might want to know at what point can I get away with a simple low pass filter okay, even though I am doing a square root raised cosine. So that seems like a reasonable design question to ask. Okay, So you will have to answer that with what, what are you paying for? Will you get something? What will you get? Can you detect that very easily? Okay, See remember low pass filter sampled is also an orthonormal correlation so technically that's optimal shouldn't lose anything but your detector will become more complicated okay because you may not get rid of isi you may not okay? you will not right so because nyquist criteria will not be satisfied anymore if you do g of t and not if you don't do g star of minus t right remember how nyquist criteria is satisfied for what mod g of f squared okay so assuming at this point whenever you sample right at this point when is nyquist criteria satisfied only if you have mod g of f square if you have something else there that may not satisfy the nyquist criteria okay so you should remember that all right any other comment that i wanted to make does anyone want to make any comments about this anything that's disturbing you it's fine okay yeah yeah you should span that's that's something important okay so yeah I'm sorry that's that's an important point okay only you can you you the any other correlation with respect to any other orthonormal basis will be optimal only if it spans the entire uh, signal space so in in the in the race cosine sync case you might lose information i'm not saying okay. all right okay so another thing to keep in mind is if you if you just want to get rid of isi it seems like the most important time domain criteria is every t seconds your signal corresponding to every symbol should go off to zero okay pretty much that seems to be the important thing okay so you have to make sure your zero crossings occur every 
capital T seconds and your signal falls off fast enough. Okay, that seems to be a rough way of satisfying the ISI condition, right? At the transmitter end, at the receiver end, if nothing else is getting added, and if you and if you filter properly, it should work out. Okay, so that's one more thing uh, to keep in mind. Okay, next question I'm going to ask is uh, very very simple, but we'll quickly do that. I want to I want to emphasize that. Suppose instead of this W by two and minus W by two, I say minus W and W. Doesn't mean anything, right? So wherever you have W by 2, wherever you have W, you should put 2W. Okay, so notice if you notice in the pulse shape, nothing will change because it's in terms of capital T. Okay, so I, I, if you look at the definition of my raised cosine and square root raised cosine, everything is in terms of capital T. Okay, and T is related to the bandwidth, but everything is in terms of capital T. Okay, so that's a good lesson to have. Any algorithm you have for transmit and receiver, it should be as a function of symbol time capital T okay don't make it a function of bandwidth okay, then what will happen every time you change your bandwidth you have to change all steps of your algorithm but if you make it a function of your symbol time big advantage is all you have to do is one big change at the beginning t equals change that according to your bandwidth everything else will adapt on its own so such subtle things might be crucial okay particularly sometimes when you solve problems or when in the lab for instance when you write your code these things might be easy. Tomorrow, if you want to change your bandwidth, it's the code software that you write. See, remember, all these things are being implemented by software on some processes. Okay, so that's how you should think about it. And it's easy to change that if you have such uh, notations. Okay, so only thing that will change here is this W will become 2W. Okay, so if when, you, when you go to minus W to W, that will become 2W. Everything else uh, pretty much remains the same. Okay, so another thing I've done here. Uh, is to assume that this is a complex constellation, right? So uh, that, that's something people like to relax later on. But anyway, so we can stick to the complex constellation for good. Okay, is it fine? Everybody is happy so far. So this picture is very important. And a similar picture for the previous case when we were sim signaling over a very long time. Okay, so that picture was also important. Okay, so both, both those pictures should be clear in your mind because that's the first cut implementation for any digital communication system. So that you should know very clearly. Okay, so I think it's uh, pretty much all I wanted to say. Okay. All right. So let's. Uh, so 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 the next few things we'll see is to write down some. Okay. So next next things we'll see is notions of capacity, SNR, and a quantity called E B over N naught. Okay, so these are uh, these are important because these are ultimately the figures of merit that we'll be shooting for. Okay, so whenever we want to communicate, you want to communicate close to capacity because capacity tells you that that's the maximum you can do. Okay, so you want to communicate close to capacity, and uh, SNR is an important parameter that we saw, and this EB over N naught also turns out as a very crucial parameter. So I'll I'll, I'll define that and then we'll uh, fix the whole thing up. Okay, so the first thing is capacity. What what uh, capacity for the ideal band limited AWGN channel, like I said, was given by Shannon in his 1949 paper. So it's been known for a long, long time. Okay, so this is ideal band limited. So I'm assuming my H of F is, I'll say band limited to minus W to W because that is the standard uh, uh, assumption that most books will make. So I've been doing W by 2. I don't know why I did W by 2. Maybe I should also turn minus W to W. Anyway, it doesn't make any difference. Okay, so it's the same thing. So this is H of F. So which means what? My X of T is such that bandwidth of X of T okay, is less than or equal to W. Okay, so I, I fixed that. Okay. So what's my maximum signaling rate? Signaling rate can be 2W. Okay, so when one can imagine using a 2W signaling rate. So, so now we are looking at capacity. So once when you want capacity, you are going to use the maximum signaling rate. There is no point in using something less than that. Okay, So that is how it will work. Okay. So a few definitions before we define capacity. We will call P as power of X of T. Okay. So this is the uh, power in the signal. Okay. So remember Y of T is your received signal. Okay. So power in the signal component of the received signal. Okay. So that is what this X of T is. Okay, so I'm assuming it's come to that. Okay, what about power and noise? Okay, so so we've been thinking of the no power spectral density of noise as what? Flat at n naught by two. This is the PSD of 
noise. Okay, so now I have a bandwidth minus W to W. So what is PSD? It's power spectral density, basically power per hertz, okay, per unit frequency. So if you want total power and noise, I should take N0 by 2 and multiply by the total frequency. Okay, so N0 by 2 times 2W, you will get N0 W. So you see N0 W is power of noise. Okay, so that's uh, this is crucial. Okay, and uh, if you do all this, and if you choose your symbol rate, you can choose your symbol rate to be 2W. Okay, so this is symbols per second. Okay, it turns out you can show the maximum rate that you can transmit. Okay, so the maximum rate. with arbitrarily low error rates okay so this is called capacity this guy has a very very simple nice formula works out to be w log 1 plus p by n not w bits per second Okay, so so it's 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 difficult to do a proof of this in so log base two. Okay, so it's base two. Base two. Okay, so it's difficult to do a proof of this in this class. If at all if at all uh, you get to do a course in information theory, this is definitely a standard proof which will be done in that. Okay, so like I said, it's a proof. It's a theorem and a proof. It can be stated very clearly. It's not one of those hand waving formulas which you use. Okay, so it's an exact result. Okay, so it's not uh, under this channel model this is an exact result you can't do better okay so it, it works both ways as in it, there's also a converse what do i mean by that if you transmit at a rate higher than this then you cannot achieve arbitrarily low error rates your error rate that you can achieve is bounded away from zero by some finite number you cannot keep on decreasing it okay so since it's a, so it's a strong relationship so this is the best you can do and you can do no better than this both ways okay so, so keep that in mind this is the operational meaning of capacity one nice thing to notice is capacity is a function of i can write it as function of two quantities okay so well you might say three p n naught and w but the ratio p by n naught w also has an operational meaning which is the snr okay so the snr is defined as p by n naught w for this waveform channel okay so this is remember this is for the waveform channel right it's continuous time channel okay so one can say capacity is a function of two things bandwidth and snr but remember how's my snr defined snr also has bandwidth in it okay so you can't just throw that away okay snr also has bandwidth in it so just by increasing bandwidth what will happen to my snr it's going down does that make sense why does my snr go down if i increase bandwidth increase my signal rate okay i'm changing only time right i'm signaling faster so why should my snr go bad you're letting in more noise okay so that's the way to think about it when you're signaling faster you're using a larger bandwidth which means you're letting in more noise for the same signal power that you had okay <coughs> so it makes sense that snr should go down if you either increase bandwidth or decrease your power okay alternatively there are two ways to improve your snr okay what are the two ways to improve your snr one is to increase your signaling power or decrease the bandwidth or slow down your transmit rate okay so reduce your symbol rate there's one more way okay which is that way okay so you control n naught what is n naught now it is ambient temperature noise right so how will you control the ambient temperature noise by reducing the temperature so you'll see a lot of receivers particularly for satellites and all that will be cooled by liquid nitrogen and all that okay so they'll keep the receivers at such low temperatures so that this n naught you can control Okay, so but somewhere something has to give you know i mean if you go all the way down to like zero kelvin or something so you can do some such calculation and come up with the minimum n naught possible but that's one more way 
of decreasing your improving your SNR. Okay, cool your receiver. Okay, don't cool the transmitter. Okay, so cool your receiver to some very low uh, temperature. So N0 will not, not automatically go down, and you can improve your SNR. So all these tricks are used in practice. So if you see most uh, uh, receivers will always be cooled. They'll never keep uh, keep it hot. Okay, all right. So this is capacity in terms of bits per second. Okay, so so we have to translate this into our vector model. Okay, into our constellation. Okay, so that's important because once you do that, then we then we can uh, then we don't have to worry about x of t and n of t, and we can work with our model itself and be happy about it. Okay, so let's let's see how to do that. <coughs> okay, so what was our discrete time no ISI model? Okay, our discrete time model. Remember, it's no ISI right now. My assumption is y of t is x of t plus n of t. So I've chosen my signaling rate and my transmit filter and all that suitably so that ISI is avoided. Okay, so in the discrete time model, y equals x plus n. This is my model. One thing I know that will be carried over is energy. Okay, so energy in the signal. Okay, E s is what? We saw its expected value of x squared. Okay, right? This energy is being put out every t seconds. Okay, so well, it's an average energy, but everything is average. Okay, so average energy is being put out every t seconds. So what will be my power? E s by t. Okay, so that's a good way of relating E s to power. Okay, so p, the p that I had before, the same p that I had before, can be written as E s by t. Okay. And then what do I know about t? T is 1 by 2 w. Okay. So if I use this relationship, I see that my waveform SNR, which is p by n naught w, becomes what? E s by n naught t w, which is t w is what? 1 by 2. Okay. So it becomes E s by n naught by 2. Okay. So in my discrete time model, what is n naught by 2? It's the variance of noise per dimension. Remember, it's not the sum total variance in 2D or anything. Right? In each dimension, I have a variance n naught by 2. Okay. So that's how I showed it. Right? You remember, I said n of t when filtered by a bank of correlators at the output in each dimension, I will get n naught by 2 as the variance okay so es is my uh, energy every t seconds okay depending on whether or not i do pam or qam or qpsk this this quantity will be evaluated differently okay so if i do mpam what is it if i do mpam es is what m squared minus 1 d squared by 12. If I do m squared qam, what is es? Same guy multiplied by 2. You know, I mean, you calculate it differently, okay? But what about the denominator, n0 by 2? It remains the same, but it's per dimension, okay? So, n0 by 2 is noise variance or noise energy per dimension. Per signal space dimension, okay? So this is a conversion that one needs to be aware of. Okay. Sometimes people use ES by N naught instead of SNR. Okay. What will be the difference between those two measures? It will be a factor of 2. Okay. So ES of ES, SNR is 2 times ES by N naught. Some people use that instead of uh, these things. Okay. So we will quickly see all these things don't matter. It's just shifting of the curve and I will tell you how to get rid of all these things. Okay. So it's, it's, it's very easy to not worry about these things. Okay, so the next thing is to look at capacity. Okay, so it seems to be confusing if you use uh, bits per second. I want to be able to convert capacity into bits per signal space dimension. Once I convert that into bit, once I convert that into bits per signal space dimension, then everything works out perfectly fine. So then I can I can I can also look at my constellation and figure out my probability of error, rate, and all that per dimension, and then I can compare. Okay. So that turns out 
you have to divide the capacity by 2w okay so why once again we'll see maybe we'll see later on maybe in this course or if it will be done rigorously later on if you do an information theory course okay so capacity in bits per dimension turns out to be the previous guy divided by 2w okay there are easy ways to motivate this but um uh, i don't know maybe maybe later on if we have time we'll do it okay remember this is bits per dimension dimension of signal space okay so that's the way you define uh, capacity okay so 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 you see you're divided by bandwidth you've divided by bandwidth right so this unit can also be thought of as bits per second per hertz right so i divided by bandwidth and i said dimension but instead of that you can also retain that bits per second per hertz remember second times hertz becomes a dimensionless quantity so it's okay to simply call it bits but but it's it's common also to say bits per second per hertz okay so anything in this units is typically called spectral efficiency okay so how efficiently you are using bandwidth okay and this is some kind of a maximum right you can never do better than this if i give you w hertz of positive bandwidth you can never do better than half log 1 plus snr bits per dimension okay if you have an snr of whatever snr that you have but remember w also plays a role here in snr okay w plays a role there so you should be careful about that computation so you should not get carried away by this is half log on plus snr okay if you if you reduce your signaling rate snr will actually improve okay all right so that's the capacity and we'll come back to this soon enough okay so before that we want to do a few more things okay so so what are all these things useful for like i said whenever you design or develop a communication system or evaluate a communication system you are always interested in probability of error versus some quantity which which is like snr so far we just saw snr right and uh, you want to do that and then you want to compare against capacity okay for the same snr what's the best i can do okay and then you compare those two things okay that's why these things are useful so one more quantity which is very related and very very uh, often used much more than snr is this eb over n not okay so what is this eb eb is defined to be energy per information bit okay okay right suppose you are using see now the number of bits in the constellation becomes important okay so i'm defining eb as the energy per information bit what is this information bit we'll come to later okay so but right now just take it as a definition okay so suppose i have a constellation x okay and suppose now say r is the rate in uh bits per symbol okay so if you do uncoded transmission what is r in terms of size of x i'm sorry log base 2 size x okay so this is equal to log base 2 size x if you do uncoded transmission okay so this is for uncoded transmission okay so remember that so it's a very simple calculation to do if you do uncoded transmission okay so later on we'll see maybe we'll see a simple example or later on i'll point out that several times you do coded transmission as in even though you have log base 2 size x log base 2 size x possible you won't do that you'll do something lesser than that okay it turns out to have advantages and it turns out it's powerful enough to take you to capacity so that's the idea of coding but for now whenever i say constellation x the rate is log base 2 size x so for instance if it's m p a m what is the rate log m base 2 if it's m square q a m 2 times log m base 2 okay m m p s k log m base 2 okay so that's the way you do this computation so very simple computation okay so once you do that the energy per information bit is very easy to define okay in terms of symbol energy every symbol has energy es okay every symbol carries r bits per 
symbol. So, the energy per information bit has to be Es by R. Okay. So, that is the simple definition for Eb. Okay. So, now one can relate SNR and Eb over N0 in a very, very easy fashion. Okay. So, what is SNR? SNR is, we saw it is Es by sigma squared. Okay. Es we just now saw is Eb times R. What is sigma square in terms of n0? It is n0 by 2. So, you see Eb over n0 is SNR divided by 2 times R. Okay, so, this is an important formula. Okay, it seems like a very trivial thing to do, but anyway, it is important enough that I should box it. Okay. So, that is why it is also called rate normalized SNR. Okay, so this, this is uh, Eb over N0 is important for various reasons. So, for instance, SNR somehow does not have the information about number of bits per symbol, okay, which is a crucial thing because capacity is defined in terms of number of bits per dimension or number of bits per symbol. Okay, So, you should know what rate you are doing and that should be somehow closely related to the SNR. So, if somebody says I am achieving 10 power minus 6 a symbol error rate, right? At, at some SNR of 3 dB. If you have two systems and SNR of 3 dB, both of them are achieving, achieving 10 power minus 6 symbol error rate, you should not say both the systems are doing equally well. Okay, You should also know what rate each system is doing. One system might be doing 2 bits per dimension while the other system is doing 1 bit per dimension. Okay, So, in that case, one system is better than the other. Okay, So, one, to make a fair comparison, you have to normalize by rate. Once you normalize by rate, it is enough if you just look at EB over N0. If you take EB over N0 into consideration, you do not have to worry about rate anymore. So, that is the advantage of EB over N0. Okay? So, one calculation that is very illustrative in EB over N0 is calculating EB over N0 for MPAM and M squared QAM. Okay? Okay, how will you compute EB over N0? So, this is uncoded. Okay? So, it is all uncoded. So, we will take Okay. What is e, EB over N0 now? You would look at ES. ES is what? M squared minus 1 D squared by 12, right? Divided by what? SNR, right? And then you divide by 2 times rate. Okay. So, it is good to write it this way. So, it is a little bit clear. Okay. So, what do you get the answer to be? m square minus 1 d squared by 12 n naught log m base 2. Okay. So, you see the division by log m base 2 shows up in E b over n naught. Okay. All right. So, so now we know for m p a m probability of error is what? Q, did we have a 2 in front? So, it is about 2 Q square root of 3 SNR, right? So, SNR is what we SNR divided by M squared minus 1. Is that right? Is this the formula we had? Okay. So, if you do the simplification and write it in terms of EB over N0, what do you think you will get? It is not a very difficult thing to write down. Okay. So, remember EB over N0 is SNR by 2 times log M base 2. So, you will multiply by 2 times log M base 2. So, you get square root of 6 by M squared minus 1 EB over N0. Okay. So, the uncoded plot for MPAM with respect to EB over N0 will be slightly different from PE versus SNR. So, if you plot PE versus SNR, Okay. So, you will get a certain picture. Okay. So, this, suppose this is 10 power minus 6. This point will be roughly around uh, let us say 14 dB. Okay. Some number. Okay. So, if I do the same plot 
with respect to eb over n naught what will happen k in db k what will happen this curve will shift to the left or right to the left by both 3 db right factor of 2 okay so this you will get the same picture but except that this point will be around will be around roughly 11 db okay so that's the, that's the picture i think i believe this 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 is for say m equals 2 okay so so it's very standard to do this in db remember this plot is much more standard than snr okay particularly when you do coding and all that you have to take care of r okay the rate r and for those cases pe versus eb over n not is much more standard than pe versus snr okay you don't have to worry too much about this it's just a 3 db shift okay but in terms of uh, when you do coding and when you do more advanced stuff eb over n not turns out to be a much more natural and important measure to have okay so it's always done and you know how to go from one to the other simply divide by 2 r okay so that's the that's the way you go okay you can also do for m squared QAM and you will get some interesting similar results. Okay. So, so the last uh, piece of information is capacity in terms of EB over N0. Okay. So, this is interesting. Okay, so how did we do capacity in terms of SNR? Half log 1 plus SNR. Remember, it's all base 2 bits per dimension. Okay, this was my capacity. So now EB over N0 is SNR by 2 times R. Okay, what is R? R is number of information bits. Remember, per symbol okay so this was my eb over n0 okay any rate r that i can achieve will be less than or equal to capacity okay so i can say r will be less than or equal to half log base 2 1 plus snr which is okay so let me keep it as snr okay so the fact that i am able to achieve this rate r with very low probability of error means snr has to be greater than or equal to what you do the simple conversion it's 2r 2 power 2r minus 1 okay right so this is another way of stating capacity okay any rate i can achieve has to be less than or equal to half log 1 plus snr bits per dimension or the snr i'm using has to be greater than or equal to 2 power 2r minus 1 okay right so if i convert this to eb over n0 what will happen eb over n0 has to be greater than or equal to 2 power 2r minus 1 divided by 2r okay so to achieve any rate r i need a eb over n0 of at least 2 power 2r minus 1 divided by 2r okay so a typical point to take is r equals 1 if you take r equals 1 what is the answer you get okay, 3 by 2 Okay, so 3 by 2 in terms of db will work out as what? Some 1.7 roughly, right? So 1.7 db. Okay, so for r equals 1, eb over n0 should be greater than or equal to 1.7 db. Okay, right? So you can do a plot of PE versus eb over n0 for the system that you have and figure out at what point you are hitting 10 power minus 6 like it like, like the plot i had before okay and then compare that with 1.7 db if, if you are achieving r equals 1 okay compare that with 1.7 db then you will know how far you are from capacity so for instance if you are doing uncoded bpsk what is r 1 okay so you can do plot of pe versus eb over n0 it will hit at around 9 db or so, so 9, 10 db. Okay, so you'll see the gap is about 
9 db it's a big gap okay so that's the that's the picture to keep in mind okay so that maybe i should draw that picture okay so if you take uncoded bpsk okay i think i showed this picture before and if you plot pe versus eb over n not you're going to get a plot which looks something like this and maybe this goes around uh, 10 10 db to 10 power minus 6 okay so this is uncoded bpsk okay? and what capacity tells you is you can achieve r equals 1 at around 1.7 db this is capacity so this is the possible coding gain that you can have okay all right this is for uh, if, if you're doing r equals 1 Okay. So these are plots that are very standard whenever people describe digital communication systems. They would put a plot like this and say, this is my coding gain, this is how far I am I'm away from capacity and all. Okay. So an interesting exercise is to say, look at this formula EB over N0 okay, is greater than or equal to 2 part 2R minus 1 divided by 2R. Okay. So now suppose I say I want to keep decreasing my rate R and find out the lowest possible EB over N0 at which I can have reliable communication. Okay, So that is an interesting measure to think of. Suppose I am willing to decrease my rate to as low a point as possible, but I want to still have error free communication. So what is the lowest possible EB over N0? So to answer that question, you can take this expression and let what? R tend to 0. What do you think it will converge to if you tend to R to 0? 2 power x minus 1 by x converges to? log 2 base e okay so rhs will convert to converge to log 2 base e which is what roughly 0 0.693 this will work out to minus 1.59 db okay so there you go that's an interesting result reliable communication is possible only if eb over n0 is at least minus 1.6 db so in some ways that is a fundamental capacity Okay, but you have to be willing to tend R to very low numbers to get achieve something like this. Okay, so but for larger R, the capacity is large. Okay, so I think uh, that's pretty much most of the general things that I wanted to say. Okay, so yeah, this kind of plot I have to emphasize once again that this is this is uh, this is very important. Okay, it might seem like a very dumb thing right now. But as you as you see more and more complicated systems, it will be impossible to analyze them. Okay, so the only thing you can do is do what are called Monte Carlo simulations. So you repeat the same simulation over and over again, and then you measure your bit error rate as a function of EB over N0 and plot it on top of this. Okay, so then you get uh, some good comparisons. Okay, so that's uh, where we'll stop today. Pick up from here tomorrow.